Now, last time we learned all about um, <clears throat> uh, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. And today you're going to know about the other woman. <laughs> I can see that you're laughing. You know nothing about her. So anyway, um, so all this material is from a hundred over a hundred years ago. So the last time we discovered that Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, uh, they uh, are you okay? okay. That. Uh, they were involved in all the isms, Buddhism, Theosophy, Rosicrucian, Brahmanism, Spiritism, Hinduism, and all the occult teachings. And uh, Charles even started, I mentioned last time, that he was got, got into Spiritism and thought, I can be a great medium. So he tried lifting the tables up with his friend, you know, to see if they would mysteriously rise in the air. And then he discovered the Bible, the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. So the truth that he found in the Bible brought forth the truth that unity used to heal and bring forth um, advanced stages or states of faith and also enlightenment. And so um, incidentally, are there any Brahmins here today? I just thought I'd ask. Um, I've never met a Brahmin. I'd love to know a little bit about them. What do they eat? What do they wear? Do they wear a hoodie, a loincloth? I'd love to know about them. So, but that he was in that, and I it was the one ism I missed. Uh, <clears throat> but then I got into Alice Bailey, and I got into Dwal Cool, and. Uh, the Fillmore's missed that, and I studied all the isms that they did, the Theosophy, the Rosicrucians, um, Manly Hall, Manly Hall was just down the road for me, I go with these to keep this to him once a week, the Buddhism, Spiritism, and Hinduism, but the Brahmanism is still a mystery to me. Anyway, and the cults, I love cults. There was one special cult that I liked, um, and they said that I was actually a walk-in from a galaxy that the Hubble telescope had never seen. And I don't know there was something about that. Cults are so special because they make you see, feel very special, like you're receiving information that not the common herd gets. And there's something about that I love. Well, in 1987, I discovered the Bible, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ. And all my isms just felt impotent compared to what I was getting into. So I fell in love with Isaiah and Jesus and Paul and Zechariah and all the others. I just loved them and, and my body healed. Rarely have I ever been sick. And I do believe it's because there's a marvelous thing that happens. In the scriptures, there's mighty prairies of human information in every, uh, in every scripture that comes alive to you. So uh, anyway, so I was healed through scripture. I think I've had one aspirin in the last five years and uh, couldn't find that when I thought I needed it. So anyway, um, so I had this in common with Charles and Myrtle that I was involved in all kinds of isms and then I found the Bible. So I read everything they wrote, and um, including this right here, which is, look at this. It's all apart, but this is 720 pages. Practically everything is underlined in here. Yes, it's coming apart. But anyway, so I read that. I read everything I could about the Fillmore's. So in the front of his books, he says, unity is a link in the great educational movement inaugurated by Jesus Christ, our objective is to discern the truth in Christianity and prove it. Our purpose is to help and teach mankind to use, prove, um, demonstrate the eternal truth taught by the master, Charles Fillmore, founder of Unity. That's in the front of his books. So before there was the Unity churches, so last time we just got into the magazine. He just had the magazine, but through the magazine, that magazine went all over the world and thousands of people were reading it. 
Uh, so, but before he got into the opening a church, he decided that he was going to start societies. And I love these societies. What could be accomplished, he said, healing, reading together the Bible, a small gathering that could share dreams and visions, pray for world conditions and people struggling. They were told to also pray for the world leaders. Charles Fillmore said, two people in this society working together in perfect harmony will do the world so much good, more than 100 who are in discord. He said, begin with music and then afterwards, you're going to just sit there in the silence to see what is the spirit of truth want to say to you? They were to look for revelations and realizations in Bible scriptures. The results were so phenomenal that people grew spiritually. They loved more. They prospered in every area of their life. And best of all, Charles and Merle got thousands of letters of healings from all over the world. Small societies experienced a healing adventure. So, in the Unity magazine of 1931, someone wrote, uh, a quote, uh, wrote a question. And what they would do is they would uh, send in their questions and then they would get answered by Myrtle or Charles. And maybe sometimes the silent unity. That the question was, can we work against the law of karma? Have we greater power than the influence of the constellations in our horoscope? Are we able to overcome these influences? Myrtle Fillmore answered this. I so love it. She said, you are subject only to the Christ. Your very God self. Christ is the only ruler influence, the only presence and the only power in your life, in you. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, who is the head of all principalities and powers. She said, you are meant to have the joy, the peace, the harmony, wholeness Christ wills for you. The kingdom of everlasting joy and goodness and love belong to you. You have in Christ a heritage of freedom and mastery and not a bondage to anything. In Christ, there's no karma to submit to. You are lifted beyond karma to experience innocence and freedom and glory of the infinite. And the same thing is true concerning the influence of the stars. All manifestations act, this is so good. All manifestations act and react on one another and the natural man. So the one that is not awakened to their Christ divinity and mastery, they are influenced by outer forces that their unillumined senses are experiencing and they feel subject to them. Did you guys like that? Wow, yes. <laughs> yeah. wow, yeah. it's so good. <laughs> yes, so anyway, um, oh, it's so good. I, I won't read it again. When we obtain <laughs> our stature in Christ, we have dominion over all the outside forces. And you are all those people. Okay. Now, Charles talked about a spiritual zone. He said Jesus formed a spiritual zone in the Earth's atmosphere. Have you traveled to that zone? <laughs> Maybe. Um, without realizing it, probably more. Atmos he said he formed a spiritual zone in the Earth's atmosphere. His followers make connections with that zone when they pray in his name. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. There are heavenly places that our con consciousness yearns for that, that are all available to us. So Charles said, the words of Jesus were pregnant with meaning. They were vital living words which carried conviction and which produced immediate results. Yes, Jesus is the way shower. He came that we might have life more abundantly. He came to awaken man to the possibilities of his own nature. 
he came to bear witness to the truth. His influence in the human race cannot be measured. It's infinite and it's just eternal. He said, there's a kingdom of heaven right here now, and it's the new dimension of the mind. It's the new dimension of not just the mind, but a, an energy force that is within you is being unfolded today in spiritual substance. It is an ideal state and creative mind ready to be ushered into the minds of men. Its source is not in outer things, the source is within. Yes, Charles knew that if he could get people to seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, that everything would be added to them, all the prosperity, the abundance, the health. So he his, felt this was his mission, to move people into the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> the people were taught that their vision, I like this, he, he taught them, your vision can see heavenly kingdom realities that they only kept God foremost in their mind. I don't know about you, but I think looking at kingdom realities would be a lot more fun than looking at um, the web at some of the things that we think are going on, right? Then he said, I love this. He said, you're here for a purpose. And that purpose is never fulfilled as long as you're dazed by the demands of your senses. Nor are you fulfilling the law of your being by going over day after day, the petty round of human existence, people that hurt you, uh, the past mistakes, feelings of unworthiness. You have been cast in a larger mold than that. God did not create you to be forever dust and ashes, to be blown this way, to be blown that way. A weight sleeper, he said, in the human mind, rise out of those low, low ideals and move into these higher realms. Rouse yourself for the kingdom of heaven is right now at hand. You are a king. Bestir yourself. The Christ of God is born in you, and the hour of your reign is truly at hand. It's now. I love his passion. <laughs> the Fillmore's believed in everything that was joyous and beautiful. So one time they were in a restaurant, and the waitress, uh, he just commented, he said, wow, look at this waitress. She's just filled with joy. He asked her, he said, he, he, he commented to Merle, he said, she's, she's at, she acts like she's a unity person. Isn't this kind of interesting <laughs> that there was people out there that were not joyous and those must not be unity people. <laughs> anyway, he said to her, he said, um, uh, you seem like a unity student. And he asked if she'd ever heard of unity. And she said, oh yes, I am a unity student. She said in astonishment, and he said, well, we are the Fillmore's. Well, she couldn't believe it. She was so excited. So she brought all the other waitresses around, and they were all Unity students, too. And then the chef came out, and he had Unity on a cake, and he said he was a Unity student. So the Fillmore's sat there, and they said, look at what our work, look how it's being expressed. <laughs> so... He, he, he taught that the mission of Jesus was to open the way for the Holy Spirit to enter into the minds of the people. He said the function of the Holy Spirit and spirit of truth implies distinct, personal subsistence. He speaks, the Holy Spirit speaks, searches, selects, reveals, reproves, testifies, leads, comforts, and distributes to every person the truth that asks. The normal condition of man is one of inner communion. It is the mission of the Holy Spirit to bring men and all women into this inner communion. And he who is buried in sense limitation must find a way out of that into the place where the light is shining. It is the mission of the Holy Spirit to guide one in order that he will not mistake the way and wander into the darkness of all the delusive paths that are out there. 
So the majority of cases that came to silent unity, he said, belong to the class of the discouraged woman in Luke chapter 8:43, who spent all of her living upon physicians and could not be healed. Doctors who pronounced them incurable and as a last resort, they turned to God. He said the hardest part of our work is the healing, is to get out of their minds the verdict of the doctor, because they made the doctor an authority, and that, uh, the, and that their case was incurable. We have discovered that there are no incurables in unity. With God, all things are possible. Any experienced healer will tell you that he's been the instrument through which all the popular diseases have been healed. Written 120 years ago. I can testify to my own healing of tuberculosis of the hip. When a boy of 10, I was taken with what <clears throat> at first was diagnosed as rheumatism, but developed into a very serious case of hip disease. I was in bed over a year and from that time an invalid in constant pain for the next 25 years. Or until I began the application of divine law that Myrtle brought in. I just love that. I just love it. Two very large tubercular abscesses developed at the head of my hip bone, which the doctor said would finally drain away my life eventually, which could be soon. But I managed to get about on crutches with a four-inch cork and steel extension on my right leg. The hip bone was out of the socket. It was stiff. The leg shriveled up, and it ceased to grow. The whole right side became involved, my hearing, my eyesight. From hip to knee, the flesh was all glassy adhesion with little sensation. But when I began applying, uh, when I began applying the spiritual treatment, there was for a long time very little response in my leg, but I started feeling better. I found that I began to hear with my right ear. I could see better out of my eyes. Then gradually I noticed I had more feeling in the leg. And he said, then as the years went by, the ossified joint began to get limber. And the shrunken flesh filled out until the right leg was almost equal to the other. Then I discarded the cork and the steel extension. I wore an ordinary shoe with a double heel. Now that leg is as large as the other one. He said, the muscles are all restored. And although the hip bone is not yet in the socket, I'm certain that it soon will be and I will be made perfectly whole. He said, I'm giving you minute, minute details of my healing because it would be considered a medical impossibility and a miracle from a religious standpoint. However, I watched the restoration. Year after year as I applied the power of thought, and I know it's under divine law. So I'm satisfied that here's proof of the law that the mind builds the body and can completely restore it. And then we want to remember, it was actually because of Myrtle Fillmore and her extraordinary healing that inspired Charles. Now, I love this. This is Myrtle. 50 years before the inception of the science of psychosomatics, which treats uh, the relationship between the mind and uh, the bodily illness, Charles and Myrtle already knew it. They already had been teaching that the ills of the body are the result of our wrong thinking, that the disease has its origin in negative mental and emotional states. And over and over and over again in the early pages of Unity, they traced physical disturbances to mental causes. And many years ago, this is so good. Myrtle wrote this to someone who was writing in from Silent Unity. She said, you know, perhaps it will help you if I tell you that I suffered with a terrible, um, a trouble similar to yours for years. And I prayed for healing many times and I did all I knew to please God and still my healing did not come. I tried to look over all my faults and to bring myself into harmony with truth after asking the Lord to show me just what was hindering me. Have you ever known people that do that? They get really ill. What could have caused this? And they kind of go back in. Well, maybe I was, you know, I was angry with this one or 
resentful towards that one. That's probably my problem. But she said something fascinating. She said, Spirit told, spoke to me very clearly saying, well, you've been looking among your faults. Now suppose you look among your virtues. I did. <laughs> and there I found the cause of the deep-seated physical suffering and congestion I had. I had considered it a virtue to control my feelings, to never give way to outwardly, to anything outwardly to never let anyone know when I was hurt or angered. I kept a calm and a pleasant exterior. But inside, did you really know this about Pearl? She said, inside, I was resentful, I was worried, and I rebelled inside of me. Didn't let that out. And my secret thoughts and feelings were uh, cutting and congesting and weakening every vital organ and the walls of my body. And as I turned the light of spirit upon these hidden things and sought to have a divine mind transform my very subconscious mind, I, um, I could work from a new basis. I was healed and restored completely to harmony and strength. God does not change. All that keeps us from our good is our failure to unify ourselves in thought with the source of all good. So here's what she discovered, which I think is wonderful. Have you all heard about Myrtle and the healing she had? Yes. Oh, yes. who has not? Oh, a few people. Oh, oh, okay, okay. So Myrtle Fillmore wrote one of the most popular articles that the Unity Magazine had ever, ever read. And it was the story of her healing. And it was um, her amazing healing that Charles saw that inspired him and inspired thousands of people to experience healing. She said, I've made what seems to me a discovery. I was so sick. I had all the ills of my mind and body that I could bear. And medicine and doctors ceased to give me relief and I was in despair when I found a practical Christianity is what we practice today. He said, she said, I took it up. I was healed. I did most of the healing. I experienced the healing because I wanted the understanding for the future and for students in the future. And this is how I made what I call my discovery. She said, I was thinking about life. Life is everywhere. And life is intelligence. And then I thought, ah, intelligence as well as life is needed to make a body. Now, here's the key to my discovery. Life has to be guided by intelligence in making all forms. The same law works in my own body. So life is simply a form of energy and has to be guided and directed in man's body by his intelligence. So I told the life in my liver that it was full of energy and vigor. I told the life in my stomach that it was full of energy, strong and intelligent. So I went through um, and I told my, I love this part. She said, I just told myself I was infested with no ignorant thoughts of disease put there by myself or my doctors, but that it was all a thrill with the sweet, pure, wholesome energy of God. My whole body, I told my limbs that they were active and strong. I told my eyes that they did not see <clears throat> of themselves, but that they expressed the sight of spirit and that they were drawing on an unlimited source. I told them that they were young eyes. They were clear and they were bright eyes because the light of God shone right through them. I told my heart that the pure love of Jesus Christ flowed in and out through its beatings and that all the world felt its joyous pulsation. I went to all the life centers in my body and I spoke words of truth to them, words of strength and words of power. I asked their forgiveness for all the foolish, ignorant course that I had pursued in the past when I had condemned them and called them weak, inefficient and diseased. I did not become discouraged at their being slow to wake up, but I kept right on silently and aloud, declaring the words of the truth that every cell in her body had been waiting to hear. And neither did I forget to tell them that they were free and they were unlimited spirit. 
I told them they were no longer in bondage to the carnal mind and that they were not corruptible flesh. They had an incorruptible seed that was in, the, in, in every cell. And then I asked the father to forgive me for taking his life into my organism and using it uh, so ignorantly. I promised him that I would never, ever again retard the free flow of that life through my mind. I also saw that I was using the life of the father in thinking thoughts and speaking words. And I became very uh, watchful as to what I thought and what I said. I did not let any worries or anxieties enter into my consciousness. My body was completely from head to toe made well. Now, <clears throat> one of the publications wrote, is this a time of illness for you then? This is the time for faith. It is the time for remembering that your body is the temple of the living God, that the cells of your body are imbued with living substance, that the healing power of God is mighty in the midst of you. With God, all things are possible. And when you proclaim your faith in God as life, you feel the strength of this faith for the faith in you is God inspired and grows as you express it. <clears throat> the contributions of the Phil Morris is more than one word or buildings. It's one of hearts and minds and lives rebuilt by the transforming power of their ideas. People have always been burned by the belief that they were born to suffer and die. Did you ever have that one? <laughs> <laughs> to be buffeted about by evil chance. They thought of God as far removed from them, willing to let them suffer and then death and all the feelings of unworthiness. The Fillmores dared to set men free. They knew that God was near, as near as one's thoughts, as near as one's own heart, as near as one's own life and love and wisdom. They saw that People are bound, not by the will of God, but by the limitations of their own minds. And they dared to strike off the shackles off the ones who came to them. A student actually anxiously asked Charles, why do I not realize this present of spirit like you do? And Charles answered, have you kept the saying of Jesus? Have you said to yourself in silence and aloud unto the very ethers that vibrate with truth, I and the Father are one. Charles demanded that his students say that over and over again. They sometimes would chant it. It was so beautiful. I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. I am 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 the Father are one. One one Father are one. I am the Father are one. You did good. <laughs> <clears throat> um, Myrtle Fillmore made her uh, transition uh, in 1931. Two years after that, Myrtle made, um, well, she made her transition to higher realms, we know that. And he asked Cora Dedrick to marry him. And she had been Myrtle and Charles' secretary, secretaries. She had been Merlin Charles's secretary for many, many years. And in 1918, she was advanced to a unity minister. They got married and Cora always called him Mr. Fillmore, even after their marriage. Uh -huh. I was telling Christine, I thought she could call uh, Mr. Trussman. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> they traveled together everywhere throughout the country where Charles would speak to large crowds. She looked after him. She was his helpmate in absolutely every way. She felt that one of the things that was going to keep him well was the alfalfa team. So every time they would pass a farm, she would say, they, they, he finally got used to it. He'd say to the driver, 
Would you please stop the car? Cora wants to get out and graze. And she'd go out there and she would gather all this alfalfa tea and bring it back with a big smile. So she was really a spiritual giant she is. And she wrote The Twelve Powers. She wrote another book uh, that tells people even deeper revelation about the Twelve Powers. So she, um, and she I really highly recommend that book. Charles Fillmore had a fountain of youth within him and the waters were forever joyously bubbling up. Life to him was a journey of jubilance. And in his 80s, he started taking singing lessons. And as his crippled leg improved, he was asking, I've got to take dancing lessons now. <laughs> so he loved to make up affirmations and he'd write them everywhere on large sheets in heavy black characters. Charles Fillmore had such an unusual handwriting, but he left these affirmations everywhere. The powerful lines of his signature almost always brought comment from people who saw it for the first time. At 94 years old, his handwriting was so vigorous as a young man. He used special writing crayons, which he carried with him so he could write on um, probably everything. <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> this is a few months before he passed on, he wrote, I fairly sizzle with zeal and enthusiasm, and I spring forth with a mighty faith to do the things that ought to be done by me. He passed away in July 5th, 1948, was born in 1854, 94 significant years. So I um, want to again invite you to please sign up for the Bible study. They're, it's really, they're very, they're very wonderful and healing. And um, I also would like to take just a moment and ask, are there any questions that you might have? If you don't, I shall go moving right along. <laughs> No questions. Didn't uh, Charles, son, or Charles and Riddleson oppose the marriage? Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, it was uh, Rickard, I believe, that did. Yeah, and yeah. Um, they were going through the marriage ceremony. And uh, what happened is Rickard, uh, you know, when it comes to that time, will you, um, is there anybody in here who opposes the marriage? I think that's how it went. And Rickard was standing in the doorway and he said, I do, please don't do this. <laughs> and um, Charles with great authority said, we'll just continue on. <laughs> so uh, that was a little bit of a disruption. <clears throat> Any other questions that you might have? Yes, who did Myrtle pass away with? I'm not sure, but she knew she was going and she knew that she had to go because there was some work that she had to do on the other side. And I think she was 79. And um, well, Cora needed to come into his life. <laughs> yes. I remember reading somewhere that Myrtle, I don't think she even had any attention. She knew she was going to pass and she told me Charlie went down to tomorrow. Yes. So I don't yeah, know it she was. They, she really knew when she was going and when it was time. It was very harmonious. Yes. I don't quite know how to say this, but yes, I believe we can psychosomatically bring on. Because I do believe that that is true in many cases. What about children? How does the church work? Children that? come into the race mind, and don't you think sometimes they take on the race mind? Right. But when they're very little, too. Pardon me? When they're very little. Yes. That's, that bothers me. Um, how does they reconcile that? Um, I think they just continued their healing practice, and the people came into that, and the parents started to realize the healing could take place mm. that would benefit the children anybody else okay we're going to have <clears throat> um okay so charles there's some real incredible teachings that they taught that we can get into next time i'm speaking that i think you will really really enjoy so I think what we're going to do, if we brought these pictures too, that we could see there's Charles and there's Myrtle. I don't know if you can see them or not. They're so dear. Oh my gosh. Let's just close our eyes now. And I'd like to uh, read you a meditation that uh, Charles said.
I am the beloved of the Lord, and he will be with me. In all my righteous words, and they shall accomplish that for which I send them forth. I cannot be deprived of my own, and I dissolve in my own mind and in the minds of all men the belief that what is mine can be withheld from me. My own shall, by the sure and certain will of God, come to me, and I now welcome it in the presence of this clear perception of truth. I'm under obligations to no one. God, my opulent father, has poured out to me all resources, and I am mighty river of affluence and abundance. My bounty is so great that people marvel at its sumptuous abundance. I own nothing selfishly at all things in existence are mine to use and in divine wisdom to bestow upon others. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for your singing. That was so beautiful. I am the father one. Thank you. Thank you.